This episode may trigger anyone affected by racism and the forced seizure of land. I think what happened in Africville is an atrocity and how they how this society can allow to do what they did to our community of Africville and get away with it. It didn't just happen like a flash in the pan. They they knew what they were doing. That's why we couldn't get uh, 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 paved roads. We couldn't get plumbing. We couldn't get water. We paid taxes. It was our land. The Africville relocation was presented as a liberal and humanitarian measure to improve the living conditions of underprivileged people. What went wrong? They cheated us, and I'm one that was cheated. We didn't have to move into the city to have beautiful homes. We had beautiful homes in Africville. If you don't move at a certain time, we'll bring out the bulldozers and push your shacks over. It's time that we looked at them wrong and righted them. I know we'd all fight to get back out there. We still call it home. Can we get you to end on the note of, let's hear Africville forever? Africville forever and a day. That's why my people own this land. They work for it, they toil for it, and they work to get this little piece of land that they own, and they try to hang on it. But when your land is being taken away from you and you ain't offered nothing, then you become a peasant in any man's country. In the previous episodes, you've learned about the birth and the blossoming of this vibrant and historical community. But now, we're about to delve into its tragic destruction. Many in the community have always known the removal of Africville was not a moment of misguided urban renewal. It was in fact a decades-long scheme to clear the land. You see, Africville's land sits on the northern shore of the Halifax Peninsula. It's a highly valuable plot of land, right between Canada's most important Atlantic port and the vital railway route to the rest of this vast country. When Africville's founders believed they had found a safe space far from the new town of Halifax, little did they know that 200 years later, it would be a key location of national importance. Generations of civic leaders from Halifax's history have made a conscious choice that Africville stood in the way of the city's progress. Irvin Carvery elaborates. People talk about the destruction of Africville happening in the 60s. The beginning of the end of Africville began a lot earlier than that, in 1915. There was no planning department at that time. It was a development department. The manager of the development department at council went and said, you know, we need that land that those people are living on is not being utilized for the full advantage. We're probably going to have to move them people off that land so we can utilize that land for a better tax base to get generate more money for the town. 1915, it began. This was being planned pretty much since our people been here, like to, to keep them lower on the on the totem pole, however you may want to look at it. You can go back to like 1905 when William Lyon McKenzie come in and want to put that railway right through our yep. land. That's the beginning of like industrialization. Yep. Now the light bulbs are going off. This is how we're going to make the money. And guess what? Unfortunate for them people over there, them yeah. black people. They got to go. They, they got to go because they gotta we, go. they're they, in the way. Since the 19th century, the city of Halifax had used the area around Africville to locate the kinds of operations that nobody wanted to live next to. A fertilizer plant, slaughterhouses, a prison, disposal pits for human waste, and an infectious diseases hospital. You can see the pattern. Every new undesirable need was met on Africville land each born out of racism, each one a signal of how unwelcome they were on their own land. These were all examples of environmental racism. This pattern carried on into the middle of the 20th century. As Halifax modernized its 
replaced municipal water and paved roads, these services ended just south of Africville, even though every resident paid taxes. In the 1980s, at a public meeting between the community and the city, Ruth Johnson highlighted the community's feelings towards this. What did the city ever give us in Africville? My grandmother, Mrs. Jessie McDonald, had a petition for every damn thing they got in Africville. They sent us from Africville to, to the uh, county, Odin Lightning, right up Lightning Hill to get your mail. She had to go and petition the city for that. There was no street lights. She had to petition the city for that. In the 1950s, the city increased the pressure on the community, insisting Africville was an industrial zone and moving the city's main dump right next to them. As a child, we would um, head for the water, we'd go swimming, and then we'd go up in the woods and we'd build camps and just that sort of thing. And it was, it was a beautiful place until uh, they, 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 they uh, started to put other things into Africville, like um, the city dump uh, arrived in Africville, and that was in the, the late 50s. Um, they imposed that dump on us. Uh, we were the last in the lease on the ladder, and at that time, the hospitals, I mean the major hospitals, Victoria General, Infirmary, they would send their garbage out to the dump on the back of the dump trucks, uh, syringes, bloody blankets, it all came on the dump and it laid there. As the dump moved next to the community, despite the noise and the smell, it became an opportunity for those struggling to make ends meet. There's some of the, the boys used to go out there when they were out of work and jump, you know, get the loom in, tin and stuff and sell. And the boys that was out of work used to do pretty good off the dump, you know, getting iron and junk and stuff and selling it. And I mean, some of the boys used to do pretty good because there's some days they would make 25 or 35 dollars off the junk because they would pile it up, you know, and they get a truck and take it out to the junkyard. And I mean, they did good. This compounded the negative view of Africville. It was described as a slum, the blight on the bay. Leon Steed was an elder resident of Africville interviewed by journalists in the 1960s about the perception that outsiders had about his home. After the not a scar on the city of, of Halifax face. It's a dirty sore because the scar is something that healed from a sore. But after the is not a scar, it's a sore. And who made it like that? The city is the cause of all of it. When you say the city now, what do you mean now? The city council, the council that they have there. And you're saying all the previous councils, too. Right. But if things are this bad, why don't you move? Yeah, I, I, know, I know this is your... where? Well, where would you go? Move to go where? As I said, we all live in our own homes out here. Detached homes. Where our children can run around. We couldn't go and live in, 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 in no apartments today. Segregated, not segregated, but discriminated as we are. Anything happened, the first thing they're going to do is blame us. The Negroes is who done it. And I say this, the entire blame of this place, the, 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 the condition that Africville is in, that could have been done better. Many of the homes in Africville had been built by the residents. Some were expertly crafted and immaculately furnished. I was born in the house with a plastic walls and a dining room and a living room and a buckless pantry, and a parlor that you wasn't allowed to go in, but the best of furniture. Anybody can come to my house and see some of that beautiful furniture that came from Africa. Linen tablecloths, silver, all of this world silver, beautiful things. There were lots of lovely homes. There wasn't a home in Africa that didn't have a piano or an organ. This is why we used to go around after the church and learn how to sing. So we were somebody's. We had our own stores. We had our church, our schools. They lived there, and unless you look down over the hill, maybe you thought they were all in Bedford Basin, but they were still down there living, minding their own business, because we didn't need anybody else. We didn't need, need to go to anybody. Deprived of city services and infrastructure, to the well-ordered suburbs and developed downtown, Africville stood out. 
the circular loop of systematic racism created, perpetuated, and reinforced perceptions that were toxic. This negative perception, combined with the chronic underinvestment from government, had created a perfect storm for the city to make its final move. It boiled down to this. Africville needed tough love. They didn't know what was good for them. Their homes weren't just an eyesore, they were unsafe. They may not want it, but in the name of public safety and the greater good, Africville had to be demolished. This is Mayor John Edward Lloyd in his own words. Africville obviously must be redeveloped. And sometimes some people need to be shown that certain things are not in their own best interest and not in the best interest of their children. Now you do this, you want to take these projects certainly by persuasion to, uh, rather certainly you don't coerce people against their will, but uh, should there be violations of minimum standards, then you have no alternative but to enforce the law, and this is universal for everybody. And the leadership among the community, an understanding that what is being done, what is being done in the total public interest, including the best welfare of these people themselves and their children. At a public inquiry decades later, former resident Terry Dixon disarmed the central premise of this argument. Living conditions, that was one of the things that they used against us. Uh, the city saying that our living conditions was, they were substandard and uh, even today, in some of the articles that you might read, you'll see living conditions brought up quite often. Maybe they weren't up to standard to the people who set the standards, <laughs> but to us, that was home. No matter what the houses looked like, there were other communities, and not just black communities, that, that, had, that had also the same type of living conditions, if not worse. But we were close to the city, and we were predominantly black. So our living conditions were used, it was used as a reason to move us. Even though our situation could have been easily upgraded with some plumbing, <laughs> some paved roads, uh, the city wouldn't give us this. And Reverend Don Skier summed up the attitude of the city to discussing relocation plans. At that time, People were not concerned by us. They always had that self-styled God complex that you could not think, that you could not make decisions, that we do all your decision-making for you. And that was what happened in Africa. They went, went through the exercise of having meetings with the people there, but behind it all, decisions had already been made. That was prime land. That was important land. That this kind of land was not for the black people. So the city began to make its move. The first step was to offer the purchase of the properties from residents. For Irving Carvery, the mindset of the older residents played into the hands of the city. Got to understand that the people that owned the land in Africville was my grandmother's generation, yeah. who were only one generation removed from slavery. Yeah. Their attitude was, whatever the white man says, I got to do. Yeah, just There's nothing I can trouble. do about yeah. it. I can remember coming in with grandmother, because yeah. she ran the post office. She had to do her post office business at Halifax North. And I can remember come walking on Goddington Street with my grandmother, and all of a sudden she would grab me by the arm and pull me to the side because white people were walking up the sidewalk, and she wanted to clear a way for them. That's the mentality of the people that owned the land in Africville, a slave mentality. The people that took Africville, slave owner mentality. So... It was easy 
for them guys to come into Africville and divide Africville and to eventually uh, uh, take Africville. When did you find out that the city was trying to move you guys out of there? Well, I, I guess uh, uh, it came to light in the, in the 60s. Uh, everything was so secretive, and then it was... Uh, they used the scare tactics to get us out of there. They, they really terrified us. Uh, they told us things like if we didn't accept what they were about to give us, then we would get nothing, and they had bulldozers and uh, land land movers and all this heavy equipment came into Africa and they started to physically rip Africa down and uh, how old were you I guess I was I was 15 I I did it so long you know it doesn't make any difference to me but is the young people they got their life to live well, I'm over that now. My woman my age, all I'm putting trust in God to uh, spare me. I don't know what hour or what minute I may go. But still, I, I love my own. I think this was one of the worst moves they ever bestowed upon us. But we were in a position, there wasn't anything too much we could do about it. We were threatened. They put threats on our heads. If you don't move at a certain time, we'll bring out the bulldozers and push us over, push your shacks over. Now, if they call them shacks, we call them our castles. When someone agreed to move or be moved, and then that same day they tore the house down. So when you woke up the next day and looked around, you found that uh, Mrs. Brown's house over there was no longer there. And that really, uh, well, that had a psychological effect upon people too. So this was the method which they used. And when you find yourself, uh, you know, all the desolation all around you, it sort of softens you up to decide when you might as well move too as well. I remember uh, my first bad experience on the relocation of Africville was we used to have a little, it was a little shed that no one used anymore, but us young guys, we used to use it as a hangout, sort of place where we went and hung out. And we used to sometimes spend the night there. And I remember this morning we were in there and a bulldozer was coming through it and the wall was coming down and we were able to get out. Now that was my first real experience with relocation. Now, we could have been killed. We were lucky to be able to get out of there. They didn't check in there to see if there was anybody in there. They just assumed. And a lot of things with the relocation of our community was based on assumptions. We couldn't fight. We couldn't fight. We couldn't do no fighting. And then again, we had nothing to fight with. What was the next thing they did? They tore down our church in the middle of the night when people were still living in Africville because they figured, well, if we get rid of the church, they'll, they'll want to go. And I remember my son coming home one night and he said, Mom, he said, uh, the church is gone. This is about three or four o'clock in the morning. You know, young people being out. And I said, oh, no, no. I said, it can't be. I said, it can't be. I said, it. I said no, Mom, he said, it's flat to the ground. And you know, that was done in the early hours of the morning. It seemed to be such a cruel thing to me to do that to a church. By July 1967, there is only one home left, and it is soon to be expropriated. Africville, the blight on the basin, embarrassment to the Halifax establishment, ceased to exist. The last resident to leave was Aaron Pa Carvery, reluctantly selling his property for $14,000 on December 30th, 1969. Once his home and business was demolished, no structures remained. The physical home of a 200-year-old community that had represented hope for generations of oppressed African descendants was now gone. The sounds of hymns bursting out from the church on Sundays were silenced. The smells of elaborate meals lovingly cooked on the stovetops were faded. The final indignity for the residents was that the city sent garbage trucks 
to help move them and their possessions to new public housing sites. They brought us in more or less like um, you had heard in a bunch of cattle. Brought us in the city. They took out their city dumps, trucks, to load up the children and brought them in and set them in the city, which this was a complete disgrace. The city disgraced themselves. This is one move they made that they made themselves. They were a perfect disgrace to do that. This is the only place in the world that you would send an old working dump truck to move children, mothers, and families into a city. Years later, officials tried to fight back at the claim during an inquiry. The voice you hear pushing back against former Mayor O'Brien is a young Irving Carvery. The city uh, is open to some criticism, obviously, on A, the basic decision, and B, the way some of the events occurred during the implementation. But there are some criticisms that are not valid, and one that was referred to a moment ago about the city moving the people in dump trucks, it was normally said garbage trucks. That's not true. I mean, there's a picture down in the display here which shows a vehicle with the logo of the city works department. But that was not a garbage truck nor a dump truck. The uh, vehicle was a clean vehicle which was used for other similar kinds of purposes. But for 20 odd years now, the city has been labeled with moving the people out of Africville in dump trucks. If you ever, or in garbage trucks, the garbage trucks that we used in those days were all compactors. Imagine what would happen to your furniture if it was moved in those. Yeah, sure. Well, all right. They, may, they were not garbage trucks. Which, yeah, okay. I'll accept Irving's correction on me that they were dump trucks, but they were not garbage trucks, as has been spread all across the country in films. They were used to haul household garbage. They were garbage trucks used to haul industrial garbage, which is even worse. One of the many sad truths about Africville is that before its destruction, most of the community had barely used welfare compared to the wider population. The trauma of relocation to public housing and the loss of community robbed many of independence. For some families, generations have been trapped in a cycle of reliance on government support and unable to recover from the loss. We grew up in Africville. We weren't rich. We were poor. But we were independent. We were totally independent. The city of Halifax, the governments, the three levels of government took a completely independent people and made them totally dependent upon the system. Put them on welfare. Put them in public housing. Today, we have third generation Africville still in the same situation. I often said to newspapers who came and said that there was a slum, I resented it, and I still resent anyone who calls Africville a slum. Slum usually are people who are, are renters and, and a place where the homeowners won't keep the property up. But they were a proud people. They did the best they could. I remember, for instance, they saw how Africville people were on the welfare. And so I did some research with some friends of mine, and I found that the white, there were, in proportion, there were more white people in, in Halifax on welfare than the people in Africville. That's why my people own this land. They work for it, they toil for it, and they work to get this little piece of land that they own, and they try to hang on it. But when your land is being taken away from you and you ain't offered nothing, then you become a peasant in any man's country. The destruction of Africville was made possible because of the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Association, which provided funds to the city of Halifax and the province to build public housing, Uniac Square. 
the reason, one of the things, the issues, one of the roadblocks to the destruction of Africville up until that time was the fact that the city had nowhere to put us. I think what you have to do is uh, do your utmost to see that these folks are provided uh, with housing as close as possible to what they would find acceptable, and yet it must conform to minimum standards. You know, in those days, uh, under the National Housing Act, a great deal was happening across the country in terms of removing neighborhoods that had a lot of housing that wasn't up to the minimum, minimum standards that the bylaws and so on called for. And uh, this was part uh, of that wave of trying to improve living conditions on the housing front. They asked Dalhousie University sociologist Don Claremont to return from advanced studies in St. Louis to conduct a study of the relocation. I heard from Halifax that the relocation of Africville was going on, that black and white uh, middle-class people who were concerned for the Africville residents were involved in the structure of the relocation, ensuring that people got a good deal and so forth. And I also got sent newspaper clippings which indicated that, uh, you know, this was really one of the seven wonders of the world, the Africville relocation. Everybody was happy as hell and the relocation was going on schedule and so forth. So naturally, I thought, well, Jesus, you know, maybe there's something very valuable to be learned from that Africville experience. And uh, I jumped at the opportunity that came up to, to do a study of, of whether or not uh, uh, it had been a success, and if so, how, and, and so forth. So I, I did come in to the picture with uh, rather idealistic and contemporary viewpoints on, on the thing and... Uh, Yes, you're, you're quite right. That idealistic social science is perhaps that, the good way to describe it. The study showed eventually that the Africville relocation was a disaster. This predisposed intellectuals, whether they were on the Human Rights Commission, whether they were fine men like Borhoi, whether they were housing experts, or whether they were sociologists like me in those days, it predisposed us not to see the, the small community uh, as a viable thing, as a worthwhile thing, not to see roots as, as good and viable. Most things follow from that one basic fault, which was the failure to see anything of any value in, in the community. Do you enjoy talking about Africville? No, I don't. Why not? Because it hurts me. Why is that, Mr. Sheen? Why does it hurt you to talk about Africa? Because it's one of the nicest little communities I ever lived in. And to tell you something, I've been around this world twice. I've never met a place like Africa. Never. But, Mr. Steed, everybody thought it was such a bad place. Who? All the, uh, the people who tore it down. Oh, the people that tore it down? That's the people that tore down the city of Halifax, the authorities of the city of Halifax. They said that, it was a bad place. That's what they called it. But it was not to us, it was a heaven, a home, a real home. In the next episode, we join the survivors in their fight back. I just left the host, I went to Africa, and I started on the ground. And I, I just stayed, and I fought, and I stayed, because that was the right thing to do. I, I knew that. The thing that motivated me was my grandmother crying in my ear. And I believe the way that's worded, just by its, the way it's written, that they hadn't had the right to take that land from us. No, I, I, we concluded that the land had been taken so long. And look to the next generation for a vision of the future. All of the things that descendants have been saying for years in us as a city taking ownership and saying, okay, we have to step up and support. I've known about Africville and I knew my family was from Africville. I learned along the way that my grandmother was like a midwife and she delivered a lot of babies in and that was kind of like, like really cool for me, like eye-opening, like wow, like Africville forever, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs>
If you want to learn more about how you can support the fight for Africville, visit africvilleforever.com. This podcast has featured the voices of the people of Africville past, present, and future. We encourage you to seek out more stories for yourself, as this show has barely scratched the surface of this incredible community. There are many more untold stories and those eager to share them. Africville Forever was hosted by Eddie Carvery III and Alfred Bergeson. It was edited by Reese Waters. The artwork was designed by Vanessa Thomas. Publicity and promotion by Nzinga Malar, Mary Gibran, and Alessia Stafieri. A special thank you to Jordan Heath Rawlings and Kyla Dudney. This has been a Podstarter production for the Frequency Podcast Network.